Welcome to episode 33 of Two Docs Talk. I'm Rob Hoyer, joined by my co-host Abbas Shafi. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, Dr. Tro Kalajian. Dr. Tro is an internal medicine physician who focuses on weight loss and metabolic health. He's dual board certified in internal medicine and obesity medicine. Dr. Tro shares his story about what motivated him to focus on these conditions. He also uh, talks about his own struggle with obesity himself and how he lost about 150 pounds after he became a physician. We talk about Ozempic and related medications. These are some of the best-selling drugs in history. We talk about uh, the good, the bad, uh, side effects of these meds, how they work, a ton of information. We also talk about different diets. In particular, Dr. Tro focuses on a low-carb diet. As always, our goal here at Two Docs Talk is to share different perspectives with you so that you can learn and find what works best for you and your family. Uh, we're very happy to announce in a couple of weeks, we're going to be recording a few up podcast episodes from Temecula, California at Abbas's farm. And so we're going to be walking through the farm, uh, talking about different foods, and also just recapping what we've done over the last two years and where we're going in the future. Our goal is to keep this podcast free forever for everybody. Please like, share, subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, Rob at twodocstalkpodcast.com. We'll put everything in the show notes. Without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Tro. Dr. Tro, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you on. And just um, curious to find out what motivated you to focus your practice on metabolic health and weight loss. Well, it started when I was 13, actually, if you really want to know. Uh, when I was 13, I weighed how much I weigh now, which is around uh, just a little touch over 200 pounds, except I was five feet tall. And uh, I remember going into Dr. Adis's office on my birthday, sitting in his office. Of course, I had a older brother who was wildly overweight, a mother who was overweight, a father who was overweight. He made me wait in the waiting room. Of course, who loves to wait in the waiting room at age 13, probably for an hour. And there was a TV there. And then he got me on a scale and weighed me and looked at me and said, you're fat. I remember it. I was just like, you're fat. Like, you're not going to be any different than your brother and your mom and your dad. He said, you can't, you can't be like this. And I remember uh, at 13 thinking, oh, excuse my language, if this is this mother, you know, I was like, uh, yeah, excuse my language, I'm a New Yorker. I was like, this guy made me wait here for an hour just to tell me I'm fat. Like he could have, he's got a TV in his waiting room. Why couldn't this guy put a bike in his waiting room? At least I could have watched a, you know, the TV on a bike. And I just remember having so much rage at the age 13, struggling, you know, seeing my family struggle with weight. And I remember that was the moment I wanted to be a doctor. I was like, I'm going to show this guy. That's when I wanted to be a metabolic health doctor. That was the moment where I was like, I have to incorporate me metabolic health. I went on, um, you know, I had a little bit of a, not troubled youth, but, you know, I, I struggled with weight. I lost weight, you know, went vegan, went vegetarian for, you know, pretty much didn't eat much for a year or two years, lost the weight, did cross country, ran, but struggled, kept, put it back on, put it all back on. Eventually went to med school, gained, you know, 10, 15 pounds per year, and then went to residency, gained 10, 15 pounds per year. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm training in the Yale, uh, Yale system, eventually becoming chief resident. And then I went to 350 pounds. I tried to learn all of medicine in the way that it was taught. Evidence-based medicine, we talk about it a lot, evidence-based medicine. I learned about hepatitis C drugs before they were approved, right? I learned about, you know, before we cured hepatitis C, five years before we cured hepatitis C, I was, I, I, that was the degree to which I studied medicine. You know, I studied, you know, research development guidelines. I aggregated all of the guidelines for the residents in the Yale system so they could have one library of all the guidelines so they can read it because I was like such a proponent of evidence-based medicine. And yet I had failed so miserably at my own health and I was 350 pounds. And uh, I remember I took my board exam and I felt so proud when I got my score. It was a 90th you know, percentile, 90th, the top decile, right? And I felt so proud. And yet um, if you looked at me, I was suffering. I was full of information, but I lacked any insight. What really reclinched, I was reborn to metabolic health was when my wife played me, my, my amazing wife, you know, 
she's an attorney. Of course, she's smarter than me. She said, are you going to be alive? And, you know, she said, look how smart you are, chief resident, you know, look at how you did on your board exam. You can't figure this out. So I did what a good evidence-based doctor would do, which is go back to the literature, look at the interventional studies, just like if this was pneumonia, and you were looking to see which antibiotic regimen is superior. I went to the obesity literature and said, which diet is superior? And I'm looking at all the head-to-head studies, Shai, Shai uh, Gardner, Zeta Z trial at the time, all these studies. All the studies, the interventional studies, showed that low carb was nominally but superior to low fat. And I'm like, what? And that doesn't make sense. Our guidelines, a pyramid says carbs are the most abundant thing we should be eating. And you know, of course, the government is trustworthy. They approve the guidelines, the National Clearinghouse for Guidelines, where I aggregated all those guidelines for the other residents. So I started to investigate the literature and look at where the guidelines came from. Of course, it was shoddy observational data. And then I compared that to the interventional data, which was wildly supportive of low-carb diets. And I said, okay, I had no bias in the game. I was just like, I want to work. I, I want to drug that works the best. So I adopted low carb diets and you look into metabolic syndrome and understanding metabolic health and carb reduction is the most potent way to reverse metabolic syndrome, which is what I was suffering from, obesity, metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, and hypertension. So I did uh, at the time what I thought was an evidence-based approach and I still agree it's an evidence-based approach, but what I found was the diet camps were so strong and the prevailing sort of ideas in nutrition are so in, entrenched in camp that the idea of a low carb diet being wildly appropriate for a metabolically sick population and myself, this was like heretical, you know, at the time it was, you know, I might as well have said, you know, maybe we should wait for more day, <laughs> data when a certain novel therapeutic comes out. It was like heresy. How could you say that? So that's, that's the time, you know, this was about 10 years ago where I went from 350 pounds to 200 pounds and quite effortlessly. I never counted a calorie, was never deprived. I ate till I was full and I ate steaks and eggs and bacon and chicken and fish and asparagus and broccoli. And I had zero hunger, which is, you know, which is something I struggled with, you know, when, when I was in the Yale system and my I remember my uh, director said, well, why don't you just, you know, count your calories? And I, and I was like, I don't think you understand, you know, how hungry I am. But the hunger just completely went away. So that was my journey. And, and when I saw that there was metabolic health at the time was like basically taboo. I mean, you know, to go against the USDA guidelines, you know, at the time, you know, Gary Fetke went on trial, Tim Noakes was on trial for promoting low-carb diet. I, I said, I, I, I can't I can't practice the same way. I have to practice this way, and I have to support people the way I wish I had support. So that was when I, when I started, and this was seven years ago I started my practice, and uh, largely focused on ECK, CGMs, blood pressure cuffs that re- track remotely, scales track remotely, you know, everything, remote sleep studies, uh, remote holter monitors, remote everything. So we have a fully, you know, uh, fully remote practice now that uh, focuses on on metabolic. Of course, I got obesity medicine certification and you know metabolic health uh, practitioner certification since then. So yeah, that's my origin story. Sorry to. That's inspirational. Well, that's Thank beautiful. you for sharing that. What's your daily diet? Um, if you can go through this as simple of your daily diet um, as you know, for an average individual or yourself? Sure. Today I had a jar of pickles and uh, maybe a pound and a half to two pounds of 85% lean ground beef. That's what I ate today. Hamburger bread. With uh, some no sugar added ketchup. That was today. And a handful of peanuts to make my you know, Mediterranean cardiologist happy. Uh, you know, got to include the nuts and uh, the pickle and the vegetables. You know. um, yeah, I went on a cruise recently. I lost two pounds. It was a low carb cruise, and I ate probably uh, two to three pounds of meat, fish, and chicken a day. I lost two pounds. So um, a lot of vegetables, a lot of you know salads. Uh, the day before, I had a big salad and. Uh, uh, 
chicken. I'll have Greek yogurt. Uh, what percent uh, of your diet is vegetable and non non uh, animal protein? Calorically? Yeah. Maybe ten percent. Yeah. Do you use any medicine through those that uh, your journey or no? No, no, I haven't. Uh, I mean, do you consider magnesium supplementation medicine? I don't. I don't know. You know. So besides, you know, the occasional magnesium supplementation, not not no medication. No supplements, no, uh, no nothing, pretty much nothing. Um, so what do you old, think of this Ozambic and this GL1 um, agonist? What were your thoughts on that? And, and maybe if you could describe also what they are first, just for our listeners, because I, 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 I don't think everyone knows what these medicines are. So that may be helpful to, to start out with that. Yeah, so... Uh, so there are hormones in the body, gut hormones called incretin hormones, and uh, the first one was discovered over 30 years ago, actually. Um, and uh, you know, these have been used. You guys both know these have been used for over a decade. You know, uh, so they're not exactly new. But if you go back, I was looking into the origins of this and how they found it. So. Um, you know, it's interesting, this whole line of medications that are now out, you know, Zempix, Extend, uh, Manjaro, Zepbound, Wagovi, they're all the same thing. They interestingly come from the uh, saliva from a Gila monster, you know, a Gila monster. It's a lizard. Uh, you guys have them maybe by you. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the Gila monster is an interesting lizard. It's a binge eating lizard that feeds about four to six times a year. And so when this monster, when this lizard, you know, they're very slow moving and they have these enormous tails and the tail stores all the fat and all the water. And so um, they found out that when this monster chews, okay, it has a paralytic agent in its venom, but then it also releases exenatide 4 or xenotide 4, which is this, it's just basically what what exenatide the first drug that uh came out in this class about a decade ago or two decades ago um it releases this this drug and it makes the the and and when you put food through a nasogastric tube into the lizard into its stomach it doesn't release it so releasing this hormone comes from mastication from the lizard and it releases the hormone and the hormone does a couple things it stabilizes uh the its blood sugar and it makes it not want to feed again for a couple of months so it is literally the hormone of a binge eating lizard that we are giving to most people now to many people um and it uh it has a very interesting function at a low dose what it does is it uh, makes insulin release more efficiently. So in diabetes, you have to imagine, you know, when you have a blood sugar excursion, when you eat something, let's just say like ice cream, you know, it's uh, carbohydrate and fat. And so uh, typically a blood sugar would rise up almost immediately after eating this and remain elevated for an hour, anywhere to, you know, if you're very metabolically healthy, less than an hour. And if you're a pre-diabetes, maybe two hours. And if you're diabetic, maybe three hours. And if you're very severe diabetic, the blood sugar remain elevated for four or five hours. And what we have found is that very initial bolus of uh, a highly efficient insulin released from the pancreas in, within the first seconds of you eating, that gets lost somewhere between uh, you know, being normal to going pre-diabetic. And certainly by the time you have diabetes, that's essentially gone. And um, likely by the time that happens and you have a diabetes diagnosis, you had hyperinsulinemia, high insulin, and metabolic syndrome probably for 10 years before you got to that point, right? And what this drug does is it makes that first phase of insulin come back. It's like squeezes insulin just at the right time. 
And so when you efficiently release insulin in that first segment of eating, within initially on eating, you then stabilize blood sugar more efficiently, which will lower A1C. And uh, you will need less insulin overall all throughout the day because you're efficiently dealing with the blood sugar early on. So it's a great diabetes drug. Um, it's a great diabetes drug. Um, and, uh, and at higher doses, it takes away the pleasure of food. It, it works on the food reward centers of the brain. It basically tell you, it says you don't want to eat. Um, and probably even more meaningful than that, it gives you such terrible nausea and sometimes vomiting that you basically can't eat much. And I'm sure, you know, uh, the GI doctor with us has, has seen that happen, you know. Um, so, in fact, I had a patient who uh, we told to start very slowly. We gave her the dose regimen and she thought, well, why not give herself more to lose more weight quickly? She gave herself a very high dose of this drug without being ready for it, and she landed herself in the hospital vomiting for days. Right. So the uh, the other way it works, and it has no real effect on on weight loss, is it delays gastric emptying. Uh, but the degree of delay of gastric emptying seems not to be related to weight loss. So it is likely that the primary mechanism is the blood sugar regulation and the food reward aspect. It takes away your desire to eat. So um, the drug is pretty fantastic. You know, it's pretty fantastic for a patient with diabetes. It's pretty fantastic for somebody who um, otherwise cannot actually implement a diet. Uh, there are some the serious side effects. Um, there was a French study uh, showing that there was an increase in thyroid cancer after long-term use. There were some other studies saying that maybe that's not the case. The, the largest studies observationally looking at this drug with thyroid cancer are neutral. But we know in animals it causes thyroid cancer, which means it likely causes thyroid cancer and simultaneously weight loss prevents thyroid cancer, and so it is neutral, right? So, um, so it, it does, uh, in family members who have thyroid cancer, uh, we, we specifically medullary thyroid cancer, uh, we will, uh, which the good oncologist can maybe talk to us more about, will be very cautious with its use. It was a, a male Worcester rat that had the uh, medullary cancer uh, signal in the original studies, but post-marketing observational studies seem to suggest that it is a true signal. Um, those are the big, uh, the big issues, really the GI side effects, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, the thyroid issue. Uh, in, alcohol, in people who drink alcohol, I'll be very cautious because it can cause pancreatitis. And uh, I think the big thing for the long term that anybody using it really needs to think about is because you'll be so disinterested in food, okay, you'll be so disinterested in food, uh, if you stick to the modern diet and you likely aren't exercising as much as you should because most of us aren't, right, most of us aren't, if you're not exercising as much as you should uh, and you're on a standard diet and you're just eating less, it's a recipe to lose muscle. And it seems that one fourth to one third of the weight is, uh, is lean mass loss. Uh, there was a study in JAMA recently from highly biased folks that said that doesn't matter, but I can't imagine losing lean mass doesn't matter. Um, in a typical uh, bariatric surgery, the lean mass loss just for comparison would be about 20%. So maybe 10% better. And then with diet and exercise, the lean mass loss would be like 10, 10 to 12% just for comparison. So if you wanted to lose, lose the least amount of muscle, it would be good old-fashioned diet and exercise. And if you wanted to lose the most amount of muscle, it would be putting yourself in the hospital by overdosing on Ozempic and vomiting incessantly. Um, 
Also, after six months, some of this this effects will uh, or some of the benefits is that plateaus. Or what's your thoughts on that? Is that what's what's your experience? So, um, so if you look at the signals on hunger and craving, those signals start to evaporate around year one, right? Uh, the, the signals for diabetes seem to persist. So like if you look at the efficacy five, six years later, it's still there, right? So it still works for diabetes, but it appears that the effects on cravings, sweet cravings, hunger cravings, you know, ability to resist food, those decrease at about 12 months, right? And they return to about baseline at 24 months. So but that's like two years of weight loss. So don't discount that, you know. Um, it seems like there's weight loss maintenance at around two years. Uh, there was a more recent study that showed in uh, in people's diabetes that the uh, a four year follow on that they re- that they maintained the weight off on the drug. You know, in in people with diabetes, it seems like the weight loss results are more modest, like around ten percent. And those results persisted at four years. So the 10% weight loss persisted. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I think, but I mean, in our clinic, given how specialized we are, we, we sort of see the people who struggle the most. I mean, our biggest referral source now is Ozempic didn't work. You know, and, and it was it's the same thing with lap band didn't work, as you can imagine. And, Bariatric surgery didn't work. These are our biggest consults right now. Uh, actually, I'm out eating Ozempic. I need help. Uh, so they are they're amazing. The level of data we have for these drugs is unprecedented. You know, four year clinical trials, two year clinical trials with you know twenty thousand people in the active arm. I mean placebo controlled for two years. I wish they did that with other novel therapeutics, you know, uh, notice me being very cautious, you know, um, but you, I think both of you guys know what I'm talking about, you know? Um, so the level of data is, um, is enormous. Uh, so I'd say relatively it's a good drug. You'll get less heart attacks for sure. If you have diabetes and obesity versus, uh, a placebo. And I suspect if we did the ACCORD trial again, and for the viewer, the ACCORD trial was the trial that looked at aggressive blood sugar lowering versus non-aggressive blood sugar lowering, the target of an A1C of seven. A1C is glycosylated hemoglobin, how much hemoglobin binds to sugar. Um, If we did that trial again with these new classes of drugs, I suspect more aggressive would be superior. So, uh, you know, with that and the SGLT2 medication. With that said, the problem with these drugs is us. We will prescribe them without actually helping people change their diet, change their eating behavior, change their relationship to food, clean their pantry, get them to move, get them to sleep, get them to have a sense of community. We, we are lazy as a profession. And when we don't put the effort in and, and we just look for quick fixes and we just like to prescribe quick fixes, the end result will be our patients to suffer. And we've seen this play out with lap bands. The most common surgery for lap bands right now is lap band removal. So I think the most dangerous thing about this drugs is the three people in this room, not us specifically, but, you know, uh, us. It's us. You know, every doctor out there thinks they're going to be doing a service to a patient who struggles with food by giving them an injectable, a binge eating lizard's hormone. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, and they will think it's mercy. What about behavioral therapy? Do you, in your practice, do you use behavioral therapy as a part of uh, your weight loss? What's, what's, what's your thought on that? Uh, 100%. We do cognitive behavioral therapy. We have, we assess, Food addiction, we assess readiness to change, we assess binge eating, we look at adverse childhood uh, events, we look at depression and anxiety, um, we assess all of it. Uh, and again, 
our population is the people who struggle the most. You know, our average weight is uh, around close to 300 pounds, right? In our in our clinic, you know, you be above well above 35 BMI. Um, so we have an incredibly sick population, and um, when you struggled with weight your entire life, you know, imagine just just failing at something for your entire life. It has an impact on your psyche right, and your self-worth, and how you process self-blame, and who you blame, you know, and uh, how you uh, process sort of adversity, learned helplessness. So there's a lot of psychological block to, you know, that, that need to be addressed. Um, and that's, that's essentially what we do is we do a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, good old fashioned coaching, right? Literally helping people, right? And we use biofeedback, remote monitoring, and an evidence-based curriculum on nutrition. And we've, we've published, we've done retrospective reviews of our, you know, of our cohorts. We most recently did a, uh, a review of our employer cohort. So we have big corporations who come to us and say, you know, Tro, take our, take our sickest, right? Uh, our patients with insulin, patients with diabetes, patients uh, who have um, multiple diabetes medications, and we enroll them in our program. Uh, and they don't, they don't like call me up because they heard my podcast. They don't know who I am. The company was like, come help us. And we, we take care of five corporations now. And, and our first corporation, you know, our program is now three years in. And we have one year data on uh, about 75 patients, the first 75. And our weight loss results are 15%. And this is while deprescribing 80 medications, right? So, so on average, two medications are discontinued per patient. Uh, the average weight loss is 15.5%, which if you studied us versus Ozempic, Ozempic wouldn't have been approved. It would have been non, you know, it, it, would, it would have been, you know, a null, a null finding. And I bet we would have, I bet we would come close to Lapin. I, I don't think Lapin would have been approved compared to our, our intervention. And it's nothing, it's nothing you know, unique or proprietary, we're published exactly what we're doing, you know, we submitted it, hopefully it's accepted. Um, you know, telemedicine, you know, text-based communication, you know, asynchronous education, meaning like they don't, shouldn't need a visit from you to get educated. We have a community for them, like events they can go to every day, ask the health coach questions every day, ping a health coach something every day. They have a complete curriculum that they can access on their own and a nudge campaign to walk them through it. And then remote monitoring. I mean, it's the ultimate, why should they trust anybody here? Take the CGM, here's a bunch of lipid panels. Like you could see what happens to your cholesterol. Go eat a bunch of animal protein and you could check your own cholesterol. Don't believe me. You know, don't trust me. Why should you trust me if the government says the pyramid, you know, this is your pyramid, why should you trust me? Right, here's your lipid panel, go check. So empowering patients with their own data, um, I think is, it creates you know, uh, an environment for sustained change. And giving them you know, a lot of, uh, the, the biofeedback tools are just amazing, both ketone, remote ketone measurement and remote uh, continuous glucose measurement. You know, I, I could talk for hours, but a lot of, uh, obesity and binge related eating and food addiction is a lot of subconscious eating. You know, it's like eating that's, it's just, it's not even registering on the radar. And to give you an example, you know, I'm here, I am, I've lost 150 pounds, kept it off a decade. And I'm on the phone with some tech support frustrated. And I completely finished a plate of olives in the, in the kitchen while I'm on tech support for half an hour. And I wouldn't have known if it wasn't for the bowl of pits that I saw like 30 minutes afterwards when I went back to the kitchen, you know, so a lot of eating is just completely not registered uh, or it's so shameful and, and guilt 
provoking that uh, that they they want to keep it out of the psyche, right? Like uh, if you you know I used to hide and sneak my wrappers, like of wrappers of food, so my wife wouldn't see, my kids wouldn't see, or you know parents wouldn't see. Who knows how long I've been doing that behavior, right? So, um, or I wouldn't eat in front of other people that I eat alone, right? So a lot of eating is so subconscious, right, that a tool like a CGM really helps rip it out of the subconscious. And if you can create an environment that's very empathetic, right, you can really gently bring it out of the subconscious into consciousness. And that's the key to, to lifelong sustainable change. It's, you know, you go from being unconsciously unhealthy to, uh, consciously unhealthy and you're like oh crap i gotta do something about it and then you go to consciously healthy but it's a lot of work to be consciously healthy and eventually you want to get them to be unconsciously healthy like to the point where they're like i don't want to go back to that food because i felt miserable why would i go back and i don't want to stop exercising because i feel so good why would i stop so you know creating that environment to to transition patients throughout that dynamic it is an art. It, it it requires a lot of uh, I think inspiration, and it it's really like I don't I don't know it, it, it's it's challenging. I don't, it's like art. It's it's like being a creative because um, every case is unique. So that part is hard. I was thinking that when I see the patient with um, I I follow actually quite a few patients with post bariatric surgery, and then after a while. They, because I think maybe because of the psychological training or not having a support that should continue, they they go back to the same behavior and then they gain the weight back and then becomes actually more ill than than the one they had the stomach or they had the banding. So uh, so I was uh, I was admiring that you guys follow that uh, the behavior therapy and I think that's the key probably one of the key to success beside the diet. Uh, to people realizing what's going on and and be uh, in charge of their own health and diet. Can I make it very simple for you? There's 10 things that somebody has to do to uh, maintain a diet forever. They have to address their hunger. They have to address their cravings. They have to address their feelings of deprivation. They have to manage social situations, holidays, birthday parties, vacations, you know, uh, meetings, dinners, celebrations, right? They have to manage their emotions, coping, stress, depression, anxiety, celebration, happiness, when it comes to food. Those are five things people have to do, okay? Have to do. If they do those five things, 90%, 99% will not have an issue to any real degree, right? Like meaning like somebody's helping them week over week do these things. Then there's very common things people struggle with, problem foods. Pizza, chocolate, ice cream, chips, french fries, cookie, cake, rice, bread, right? Those are the foods people struggle with. You have to address your problem foods. What foods can you not live without? What are the problem places? I always struggle at my aunt's house. I always struggle at my friend's house. I always struggle at McDonald's. I always in my car, on my way home, after call, in the you know, doctor's lounge, wherever. Okay, where your problem times. I always struggle before I get home after a late night shift, late at night when the kids are asleep and nobody's looking. Right? You have to the people you struggle with. My wife always wants to go out to eat. My family wants to always do this. They always make it just for me. Right? From people and then problem situations, which we talked about. And the last thing somebody needs is an unrelenting desire. Do not let their indiscretions go beyond one meal. You want to go off plan? That's fine. Right? None of this, I'll keep going. I'll start again on Monday. None of this, you know, I'll start again next week. No. Enjoy your meal. It was off plan. You restart the next, that very moment. Like we don't wait a day to get our tire fixed. We don't wait a day when we have chest pain to call the doctor. We don't wait when our face is drooping. We don't wait a day. So when you're eating off plan, you do not wait a day. It is you enjoy your meal. 
You disregard the shame and the guilt and the self-blame, and you go back to your diet. Ten things. Hunger, cravings, feelings of deprivation, social situations, emotions, and coping. Problem foods, problem places, problem people, problem situations, and what I call moment zero, which is immediate recovery. Ten things, that's it. Now, if you break that down, like yeah, itemize it, the average person has 15 to, 15 to 25 foods. Five to 10 people they eat those foods with. Five to 10 places they go to eat regularly. One to two emotional states they need to manage. One to two, you know, physical states, sleeplessness, you know, injury, surgery, inflammation, et cetera. And it's a total of 30 to 55 things the average person has to do to maintain a diet forever. So the question you should have why these people with bariatric surgery can't do these 30 to 55 things, it's a psychological, it's, it's like a psychological, spiritual, mental block. And it's on us to, to discover that block with them. What is it? Where is it? Who is it? Why is it? If it's this simple to maintain the diet for it's 30 to 55 things, you know, I need 30 to 55 things when my kids go to school, go to one to basketball, the other one to do it, the other one to here, you know, get this for field day, get that for, you know, graduation, right? So if you can, if it's 30 to 55 things, then what is the real problem? And it's food addiction and mental health. One of the two, intense stress, food addiction, mental health is the answer to somebody who has struggled forever. And, uh, and that's the, uh, that is the, it's not hard. The actual implementing lifestyle change, like I said, is 55 line item. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not a, my accountant has more lines to deal with, I think, than, and so, so we have to make it simple for the patient. You know, and once we make it simple for the patient, then you ask, why can't you do, why can't really smart people do simple things? And it's usually lack of insight or some sort of emotional, spiritual, psychological block. And that's the art of medicine, you know, really helping them through that. And that's, I think that's what you mean by behavioral, uh, you know, therapy.